We're in a series called Following Jesus because Jesus did not say, watch me. He said, follow me. Two very different things. Our culture's really good at watching. And we claim to follow by clicking something in a social media platform that updates us on new information when it's posted. That's not what Jesus had in mind. Uh, the first week we talked about how do we follow Jesus when we're tempted? Because the one thing that's true is we will all be tempted by something. And then secondly, how do we follow Jesus when we have failed? Because there's none of us who are perfect. Even though we're called to follow the perfect one, we know we're not perfect. What are our options? And then we learned about how we follow Jesus in terms of sacrifice. When life is hard, what does that mean? What do we do? And then we talked about following Jesus and putting him first, not allowing other idols to rise up in our life and take his place. And this morning, I want to talk about following Jesus with the words that we speak. In John chapter 6, it says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? For those of you who think that all of Jesus' teaching was just soft and sweet, this is his disciples. And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. And then look at this. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. The words I speak are Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them would not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Uh, Jesus had said something his followers didn't understand. And as a result, some people left then and there. They walked away. And Jesus made an interesting statement about his words. He said, my words are spirit. They're full of spirit and life. Jesus also asked them if they wanted to walk away too. And the response was, we can't walk away. You're the one who has the words of life. As it turns out, words are a really big deal when it comes to following Jesus. Question, in your life, have you gotten in more trouble by the actions you have taken or by the words you have spoken? Let's just check how many here would say you've gotten in trouble for both things. Yep, that's how it works. Our lives are not just evaluated by our actions. They're also evaluated by the words that we say. And we all have topics that we're kind of more comfortable talking about. For example, weather and sports. Those are the safe things. In the last uh, uh, season in our culture, we've discovered there are other things that are not as safe, but people have gone there pretty boldly and pretty loudly. So, but weather and sports are usually safe. When it comes to faith, we often struggle to find what? To find the words. To define and describe what God is doing in our heart and in our life. Does anybody know? In fact, here's a little test. You, you can take a guess and then tell your neighbor which one you think it is, all right? So who do you think is responsible for the most words in the Bible? Who is responsible for the most words in the Bible? Go ahead, make a guess, tell your neighbor. Some of you won't guess because you don't want to guess wrong. Yeah. Uh, how many said Moses? You would be right. Moses is correct. What's interesting is that when God originally invited Moses to participate in a rescue mission to bring the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and when he had this conversation with Moses, Moses declined. And his reason was, is I'm not good with words. 
That's what he said. He said, I'm so, in fact, the actual phrase is this, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. That's a little dig, by the way. He said, I've never been eloquent in the past, and since you've been talking, nothing's improved. I am slow of speech and tongue. Most Bible scholars believe that Moses actually stuttered. He had difficulty completing words and sentences. The person who spoke the most words in the Bible was someone that told God to find someone else because he wasn't good with words. Um, the Bible itself contains a lot of words, depending on the translation, somewhere between 730,000 words and 780,000 words. That's a lot of words. And it's filled with commands and corrections and directions and guidelines and history and poetry and predictions, but it's saturated with something else. It's saturated with stories. Now, some people, when it comes to Scripture, they only read Scripture for the rules that it contains or for the history. They read it for its information. And here's what's interesting. When you read Scripture for only information, you rarely experience transformation. They, they become aware of some of the facts, but that doesn't mean that anything changes within their heart. The Bible is actually a master story. It's the story of God and humanity. In fact, there are some things in your life and in our world that will never make sense to you until you understand the story of God. God is a storyteller, and God uses words for more than just direction and correction. He uses them to give meaning. So that's an important distinction. There, we have lots of information. There's not a lack of information. This is the age of information. We have more facts and data available to us than any generation in the history of humankind. And yet that doesn't mean that we understand the meaning of things, the meaning of our lives. And so God speaks not just for direction and correction, but also for meaning. In fact, the very first page of Scripture, we are introduced to a God who speaks. And he uses his word to create good and beautiful things. Here's the point I want you to see this morning. Followers of Jesus are called to take words seriously and use words wisely. Take words seriously. Use words wisely. Now, I was raised in a home where there were very definite uh, rules and regulations about certain words. Anybody else raised in a home like that? Yeah, a few of you. And, and the ones that weren't, we can tell. Like we know. It shows up. But there, there's the big swear words we weren't allowed. But we also were not allowed to use any word in place of a swear word that sounded a little bit like a swear word. Like the word darn. We all know what the real word is there, don't we? And so that was off limits. Heck, we all know what the real word is there, don't we? Mm -hmm. And our culture, since I was a kid, have come up with a lot more of those words. And, and my parents took that very seriously. There was a little old lady in our church. I don't use that as a derogatory term. All of those things were true. She was little and she was old. And by old, I don't mean like 60 years old. I mean, she was ancient. She might have been around at the time of Jesus. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it could be. And she, she would not say the word hell. But what she would say is... H-E double hockey sticks. Because that made it completely sanctified in the eyes of Jesus. Like God was not offended by it. That got by him. Like in the censorship of heaven, that didn't register in any way. And that's what she would do. It's so easy to reduce our concept to how we think about words, to identify the words that should or should not be included in our vocabulary. We're called not just to declare truth, we're also called to tell truth. How often do we never utter a swear word, and yet what we are saying is a long ways away from what is true? 
God is looking for people who know how to listen to the words that he speaks and know how to speak. There's a great story in the Old Testament. A young man by the name of Isaiah. Isaiah, he was one of the major prophets. And by major, that just means he spoke more words. There's major prophets and minor prophets. Major prophets used more words. That's the basic distinction. And he found himself in a situation. He was already a prophet. He found himself in a situation where the entire culture was unsettled because the king who had reigned for 52 years had died. We've had experiences in the United States where a president has died while serving in an office. And it was considered something of a rather dramatic thing for a culture to have to go through. Imagine a leader that had led for 52 years. And what's interesting is that this man was a prophet, and this is what's happening in the, in the culture. In case you're interested about this, he was also married to a prophetess, which I'm sure is a politically incorrect way to say that now. We would just say he was married to a prophet. They had two sons, and they gave them names that had prophetic meaning. But in this season of, of cultural tumult because of the, the, the loss and the death of the king, he finds himself having a spiritual experience, a supernatural experience. He finds himself in the throne room of God. And he sees the Lord seated on his throne, high and exalted. And, and there's a phrase that's used, and the train of, his, of the robe filled the temple. It, it's a sign of great power and, and great wealth. And, and there's these creatures, they have six wings, and, and they're flying, and, and they are declaring back and forth to each other the holiness of God. And it's a very powerful set of image, uh, images that he's confronted with. And, and with all that he's seeing, he notices something about himself. This, we do this all the time, all right? We do this all the time. Uh, if, if you walk into a place and everybody's dressed different than you are, and you realize you didn't get the memo, you just go... And we wonder what they're going to think, right? Or if you walk into a place where everyone is very fit and trim. You got all kinds of muscles. They're, they're, they don't have a six-pack ab. They, uh, or they have six-pack abs instead of a beer keg ab. You know, like, like that. And you kind of look around, oh, geez, they're all... We notice things. What did Isaiah notice in the throne room? This is what he said. I am a man of unclean lips. And I come from a people of unclean lips. The way we use words ruins things. He's already a prophet. He's already declaring spiritual things to people. And yet what he notices in that moment is the way I use words ruins things. I wish more of us in our culture who follow Jesus could find ourselves in the throne room of God where the thing we notice is not that our words are laden with four-letter expletives and that's what's bad, but what we realize is the way we use words doesn't accomplish what we want them to. That while we're hoping to bring change and influence to a world, sometimes what we are actually do is making things worse. It ruins things. We tend to borrow words from our culture, but there's a different kind of language that is found in the congregation in the assembly of worshipers of God. It's a language of confession, confessing who God is, and we do that in our worship, and confessing the truth about ourselves, and we do that in repentance. God and the truth about ourselves. That's what we say. Those are interesting words of vocabulary. Words form the stories of what God is doing in our lives. Words form the stories of what God is doing in our lives. And I haven't met anybody that doesn't like a good story. Everybody enjoys a good story. It's been true since ancient times. People used to gather around a campfire and listen to something that had been passed on in previ from previous generations or something that had happened to someone. And we're still attracted to stories. We don't gather around the flickering light of a campfire, but we do gather around the flickering light of screens to watch and to hear the amazing stories. What if this is not a capacity that was developed in humanity over time? What if it's something that God created us for? That this is not just something humans found interesting, but it's part of the DNA that God has embedded into us. See, 
People in the Bible are not just name droppers, they're storytellers. It's a very powerful thing. Story is the primary way God brings his word to us. Story is the primary way God brings his word to us. And the reason is because it's the most accessible form of speech. You don't even have to be a good reader. You just have to be an interested listener. And you can access the stories of God. So what can we know about stories? The first thing is that stories are a gift. Stories are a gift. They make you a participant in something. When you're listening to a story, you find yourself experiencing some of the same emotions as the characters in the story. Maybe we even identify with a character in a story, sometimes with someone who's more heroic, someone maybe who's more a villain, maybe someone who is a victim. Like we find ourselves and we connect the dots, not only in the story, but sometimes in our lives as a result of having listened to them. And another thing about story that's really interesting is story always respects your freedom. Like, what are you supposed to do as a result of the story? It always gives you the option to decide what you are going to do. It doesn't force anything. It doesn't manipulate you. It doesn't intimidate you. It actually ignites our imagination, and we begin to see the possibility of things that could happen as a result of hearing this story and then acting on the truth that's in it. Now, I wish I could tell you that all the stories in our culture are good, and that would not be true. And some stories in our culture are exaggerated in order to manipulate people. And here's what I want you to know. A good storyteller never has to exaggerate anything. Stories are a gift. Stories are something else. Stories are also a tool. It's too easy to choose information over story because information is a lot less personal and we feel kind of a control over information if you can recall it if you can retain it if if you can repeat it you, you kind of feel like you've got some control if you can share information with someone who doesn't know that information it feels like a powerful thing our problem is that we try to share information about God rather than telling people our story about God if you want to know why Christianity is struggling in our culture, it's because we keep giving them information instead of the story of what God has done in our lives. And we actually feel safer. It, it's more abstract. We feel safer just talking about less personal things. But the capacity to influence our culture is found when we make it personal and we tell our story. God created us to be attracted to story, and God chooses story as the primary way to reveal himself to his creation. God created us to use story. In fact, there, here's another story in Scripture. You can find it in the book of Joshua, chapter 4. Um, there's, there's a remarkable story about how God opened the Jordan River so that people could walk into the promised land. And it's a rare story because, uh, not just because the miracle is quite remarkable, it's because the miracle is duplicated. They had seen this once before, decades earlier, where the people who were, who were being pursued by the Egyptian army and found themselves with the back up against the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army intended to slaughter them, God opened a way through the Red Sea, and the entire nation of Israel walked through and were, were saved. But now... God is using the same kind of miracle that he used to free them from slavery to bring them into the promised land. And so God told Joshua how to go about this. And so he had the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant go into the Jordan River. Now, what's interesting is the Jordan River was at flood stage. Now, the Jordan River is not that impressive a river when it's not at flood stage. But at flood stage, it's dangerous. It's a lot deeper, and the current is a lot more powerful than it would be safe for even the strongest swimmer to swim in. And he sends the priests in to the water carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And when all of their feet were finally covered with the water, all of a sudden the water stopped flowing, and the entire nation of Israel went through. It's a great story. But then God told Joshua something else. He said, I want you to pick one person 
each from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And I want each one of those men to go into the middle of the riverbed and find the biggest rock that they can carry. And I want them to bring it out of the middle of the riverbed. And I want you to make a monument over here where we have set up our camp. And they did that. And then this is what God said. When your children ask what those stones mean, tell them the story. Why? Because it is one thing to say that God is powerful. It is another thing to share the story where he showed his power strong for his people. Tell them the story. Story is how memory is passed on from one generation to the next. It is one thing to say that God is powerful. It's another thing to share the story. So scripture makes declarations for sure, but it also has stories and stories help us understand God's declarations. They help us apply the truth of scripture to our life. Stories don't weaken the truth of scripture. It helps us understand and apply it. Stories also serve the mission. Stories serve the mission. They're carriers, not just of information, but of transformation. We know this. We know this about God because someone lived out their story and told their story and someone repeated their story and that's how we came to faith in Christ. There's kind of a master story. God made us. God loves us. God rescues us. God calls us. That's the master story. And our stories find its way into his story. Stories have the power to actually transform us. It's, it's phenomenal to watch. Here's another example. Uh, David, second king of Israel, a man of incredible strengths and capacity, but also some glaring weaknesses. And he had a moment in his life that was just incredibly uh, painful for him and anybody who was aware of the situation. He had a moral failure that not only included adul adultery, it included murder. He had an inappropriate relationship with a woman named Bathsheba, and then he had her husband killed. And when you're king, you've got resources that can provide the covering of your sin, and not a lot of people feel comfortable confronting the king. But God did send a prophet by the name of Nathan to go talk to him. How was he going to confront the king? And the answer was with a story. David and Nathan are having a conversation, and Nathan the prophet tells him a story. There were two men in a town, one rich, one poor. The rich man had lots of flocks and herds. The poor man had only one little lamb. And it was really a family pet. He loved it like one of his own children. A guest came to the rich man and needed to be fed. And the rich man, instead of taking one of his many lambs, went and stole the lamb from the poor man, had it prepared, and they ate it. The end. And David was enraged. He said, that person should be put to death. That's wrong. David was enraged because David was engaged in the story. And Nathan just looked at him and he said, you are that man. You've got everything, but you had to take the one thing that a poor man had in his life that meant something to him. And in that moment, like with all really good stories, David is called into a moment of decision. It's going to go one way or the other. And so it could go towards repentance or it could go towards retaliation. David could have given an order and Nathan could have been buried next to the man he had killed in order to get Bathsheba. But David does something else. He repented. The story of the gospel changes us. We're given a choice. Accepting the story and responding to the story doesn't make us less of who we are. In fact, it's meant to make us more of who we could be. The power of the gospel, when we hear that story and we respond to it, 
In fact, one of the greatest exercises you could do in your life is to familiarize yourself with the stories of Scripture. There are hundreds. In fact, if you're interested, I actually ran off copies of the hundred most well-known stories in Scripture. If you want a set, they're at the welcome desk when you leave here this morning, and you can pick them up. Half of them are from the Old Testament, and half of them are from the New Testament. If You could always just start with the stories that Jesus told. They're called parables, because they actually influence us. You, you could in, engage in the stories of what Jesus did. They're often miracles. And then you can do something else, which is really helpful. Ask yourself... In what ways have I experienced something in my life that I find in this story? Well, that's an amazing adventure of your faith. Another thing you can do, ask yourself, what stories do you have to tell? And you might be sitting here and going, I don't have any stories. And the stories I have, I don't want to tell. Okay. How did you come to faith in Christ? That's a story. How has your faith been tested? There's some good stories there. How have you met God in your failures? Great stories. How have you met God in your fears? Really good stories. What answers to prayer have you experienced? <laughs> Great stories. What lessons did you learn when your prayers weren't answered the way that you wanted? Well, there's some great stories. How has God used you to help someone else? Great stories. How has God used someone else to help you? Great stories. What are your favorite stories in Scripture? Can you retell them? Those are great stories. Jesus calls us to be his witnesses. He calls us to be his witnesses. We've heard the stories of what Jesus has done in the pages of Scripture, but we also have stories about what Jesus has done in our lives. And he calls us to be his witness. Being a witness isn't telling other people how to live. Being a witness is telling them how Jesus changed your life. Finding fault is not being a witness. But sometimes when you see the fault that someone is struggling with and you have a story that's similar to that, and you say, you know what? Can I tell you my story? Because that was eating me alive too. That was destroying my confidence or my family. That was taking away my opportunities. And this is what I learned and who I found and what difference it made. In fact, uh, I'm going to have worship team come out. In fact, um, after this service today, in the conference room, it's the glass room just off the lobby, I'm meeting with people who are interested in being baptized in water. There's lots of stories of that happening in Scripture. But what about your story? Are you willing not just to watch Jesus, but to follow Jesus? What if that was the beginning of an incredible chapter of your life? What if the next great story of your life started with, I finally decided one day to follow Jesus into the waters of baptism, and this is what began to happen in my life. Those are amazing moments. You have a story to tell, and our world desperately needs to hear it. Let's bow our heads this morning. I've been a pastor long enough to know that many of the stories that we have to share are not of our heroic moments or our generous moments. It wasn't the time when we found the words to speak that protected someone else or the time we took a stand when, when no one else would. What tends to be some of our stories is I couldn't find the words and I let something happen that if I could go back and change it, I would. 
sometimes our story is I acted on impulse or out of selfishness and I didn't just do damage to myself, I deeply hurt others. And what I want you to know is that's not the end of your story. It could be, but it doesn't have to be if you welcome Christ into your life. That where you have put a period, he can put a comma and he can show you what happens when grace flows in and it changes your story. It doesn't erase your past. It changes your story and now it becomes a story of grace instead of failure of hope instead of despair. So Father, would you please today help us to be willing to open our hearts and our minds to go back and review the stories of our lives and anywhere we feel that something has defined us or ended something in our life, would you help us put a comma of grace at the end of that story and then watch what you can do with the rest of it. In Jesus' name, amen.